I, mean, I want to bring Ganesh in. I mean, I've read that you've mentioned scientists using a metaphor of scissors cutting out genetic sequences, and that's something you would disagree with. So there are presumably metaphors that become unhelpful or we get stuck in a way of thinking. Is that something you'd argue? I mean, yes, absolutely. I mean, m- metaphors are, are sort of time-limited um, methods, basically, for getting a concept across. So, you know, when talking about genome editing of DNA, you can use metaphors such as scissors cutting paper just to get across the concept, of, you know, top tier level stuff, but it doesn't actually work like that. So, you know, on one hand, the metaphor helps get the concept across, but on the other hand, one might say it distracts from the scientific truth of what's happening because that isn't what is actually happening there. Alluding back to, to what um, Hillary and Peter were just discussing, the scientific theories are, make predictions, right? That's actually the, the, the heart of, of science, that you can make a prediction based on what you understand if you've understood it right, and then you can go ahead and test that. And it's through these iterative, you know, predictions and testings of reality or as close to reality as we can get to it, obviously, um, that we make progress. And, you know, to, to I found myself really torn listening to both Peter and Hilary there, because on one hand, I'm absolutely, uh, you know, my heart sides with Peter. And I think, yeah, we are, we are optimist scientists, you know, we dedicate our entire lives to understanding the the finer grain movements of a single molecule in a particular organism at a particular point in time you know that's that's no mean feat as it were but equally i feel like you know there's that the the thing that i alluded to even in my opening comments sort of um resonated with what hillary said about you know is there is there any hope for uh, an organism such as um, us to actually be able to externalize ourselves sufficiently to be able to turn back and observe ourselves. And I understand that sort of reticence or that, you know, maybe pessimism, as Peter might put it, but equally, it does have to be said, we've, we've done remarkably well so far, you know, so whilst, whilst maybe the point stands, we're doing an all right job, and maybe the future looks relatively bright, I would say. Yes, Rupa, I want to bring you in because you've argued that the whole um, notion that nature is mechanical and working in accordance with mathematics is itself um, a fundamental assumption and presumably then a metaphor. Would you argue that that, that therefore can this be tested and refuted? Um, Is it not even a scientific theory in your view? Well, I think the machine theory of nature is clearly a metaphor. I can't think of an experiment you could do that would definitively refute it because you can see, uh, as Hillary said, you can look at nature in a mechanical way through that lens. If you like, the heart's like a pump. The brain could be compared to a computer to some degree. Um, but So these are all inadequate uh, metaphors. Um, I think, though, that you see, that I disagree with Peter in this idea that mathematics is somehow truer. Um, you don't use maths in most of uh, science. I mean, the triumphs of molecular biology, for example, have very little to do with mathematics. There's a bit of mathematics in genetics. But, you know, when people are doing uh, mutants and, and with Arabidopsis or Sinorhabditis and these mutational studies, they're not primarily mathematical at all. I've been wading through dozens of these papers in the last few weeks, and there's no maths in any of them. If you're doing the taxonomy of orchids, you look at orchid flowers, you go to the herbarium at Kew, you look at press specimens of orchids, you don't use equations. And if you then assume, well, ultimately, somehow later down the line with inconceivably huge computers, we could actually figure it all out with computers. Um, that's nothing but promissory materialism or promissory mathematics. And when we come to what mathematical physicists themselves do, we find that they spin webs of what I would regard as fantasy. For example, the superstring theory, which has predicts the existence of 10 to the 500 universes, uh, is one of the underlying theoretical uh, tissues of assumption underneath, under the multiverse theory. Many, many physicists, based on this mathematics, believe that there are countless unobserved actual universes, the multiverse, And uh, this, to my mind, is nothing but fantasy based on mathematics. So I don't think mathematics has any superior claim. It's just another set of metaphors, and that particular set of metaphors lead to 
untestable predictions that seem to me very close to fantasy. Um, Peter, would you like to come in on this notion that mathematical physicists are fantasists, uh, possibly respond on that? Yes, but ultimately they, they, they test their ideas against um, observation. I was going to say reality, but that would be cir circular. They, they test it against observation. If it turns out that there are 10 to the 500 universes or an infinite number of universes out there, then that would be a great triumph for the theory. And Rupert can't just lie back and dismiss it as a simple fantasy. It might be true. And we've got no way at the moment of predicting whether it is true or not. But it's worth thinking about, especially if it has other implications which can be tested. For, it, for example, uh, the same theory might predict the, the charge of an electron, in which case we can go out and measure the charge of the electron and see whether we get an agreement with observation. I mean, fantasy is fantastic but it, is, it should always be grounded in observation. Can I ask just to quickly just, follow up when we were talking about... Can I also just... Um, yes, of course. ...by saying that uh, Rupert did chastise me for... Um, well, he, he, he did make the point that um, there are theories that are not mathematical. I, need, I did make that point in my open discussion when referring to something like natural natural selection and so on. So yes, there are these two great grand classes of scientific explanation, which I would call the mathematical and the literary. Yes, thank you. Can and I, Hillary, you you've argued in the past um, that, you know, the realist notion that our scientific metaphors describe reality is in fact damaging to science. I mean, would you like to um, explain that a little more and, and maybe respond to Peter as well? Gosh, well, there are a lot of rather big uh, and difficult topics going on, on here. Uh, yes. I think th this issue about mathematics is, is certainly a, a central one to address. And uh, in a way, I applaud Peter for, for taking the sort of um, uh, pu pushing, as it were, on the scientific ontology to the point of having identified that all of the other things that people have proposed as being the ultimate bits of the universe, which might be physical objects or things or particles or whatever doesn't really stand up when you when you explore it and has sort of retreated as it were to a position of saying the world just is mathematics and um i, I think uh I, I think i understand why he's why he's made that move um because none of the other ones are available but i i don't think that we should buy that one either and instead, we should um, conclude that uh, uh, so along the lines of what Rupert was saying, that mathematics is itself a way of holding the world. But I think there is a further puzzle for those of us who hold a sort of model theoretic account of what's going on here, which is to explain why it is that mathematics works quite so well. I mean, you know, the Pythagoras theorem does predict the length of the hypotenuse and how does it do that if it hasn't uncovered something essential about the character of the world? Um, now, uh, I do have a sort of answer to that, and now is not a good, good time to develop it, but I would say it's something to do with the structure of uh, thought. It's something that mathematics operates on the basis that the world is made of bits. Uh, that's what numbers are, that you assume there is a one, there is a two, there are bits. And when you apply that principle that the world is divided into bits, you can generate a logic of how those bits function. In fact, uh, I suppose the world is not made of bits in that way. It's our thought that imposes the bits on the world, and mathematics is part of that. And uh, that's why, in the end, uh, we find uh, it can be so powerful in certain certain situations. So, the, the, yes, I mean, the mathematics question, this is the kind of third aspect of our debate, and um, <laughs> we may as well go into it now, I think, because it's, as you say, Hilary, it's an enormous subject. Um, and this kind of, Ganesh, I wanted to ask you about this because you use vast quantities of data. Um, presumably, is there a point at which things might become incommunicable without metaphors? So you almost need a way to convey these and is there a possibility that then things are inevitably simplified when they go into language? 
To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.